Welcome to Breaking It All Down. I got a new lamp. Now you can see me clearly and not have flickering and not leave me worrying about whether I should be putting a seizure warning at the beginning of my videos. So with that done, last month, actually several months ago, um, Future Publishing, the company who put out the, well, Nintendo Power Magazine, the last company to put it out, um, announced that they were stopping publication of Nintendo Power. Nintendo Power has been, frankly, a very significant part of the overall culture of video gaming since its existence. Um, I mean, if you just look at, like, the angry video game nerd, when he talks about video games with particularly d tough difficulty and obtuse secrets and that sort of thing, oftentimes he'll bring up Nintendo Power in terms of finding these secrets and that sort of thing, and often that's what you had to do back in the day. Since there was no game facts, there was an internet, but most people didn't have access to it, all that sort of thing. Also, it caught attention to readers at the time, because at th back then, I mean, nowadays, taking gameplay footage is pretty straightforward. I can't really drag the device over here to show it to you, but there are devices which the average consumer can get, that lets you capture footage from your console, take screenshots, and this isn't, this isn't even getting into stuff like emulation, where I could theoretically play all my old NES games on my computer, well, not theoretically, I can, that let me play all my old NES games on my computer, take video games, uh, footage of them, yeah, gameplay footage, screenshots, hell, it even lets me play light gun games without the use of a, needing a CRT television, sort of, I'm, I'm you have to use the mouse, but hey, it still takes up less space than having to buy a massive CRT TV and try and set that up and all that good stuff. So, I grew up reading Nintendo Power. I would check out, as a kid, check out issues from Nintendo Power from the library and just devour them when I got home. I didn't own an NES for much of the time, and even after I got the NES, I mean, the console cycle had moved on up to the Super Nintendo, or to the Saturn, the PlayStation, and so I wasn't able to, to easily find these games, and and so all of a sudden I didn't have a car, and many of these stores in the area that would sell the old Nintendo games were far enough away, it was hard for me to get a hold of these games, so I had to look at the pictures in the magazine and fill in the blanks in my head for what the gameplay might be like, and to a certain degree also... Um, basically, like, like, what the gameplay was like, what the story was like, how the cutscenes worked, all this, that, and the other thing. I put a lot of imagination. Um, so, anyway, Nintendo Power's ending was very much kind of, I don't say an end of an era for me, but it hit home to me. In the same way that, for a while, while back, when EGM ended, it kind of hit home to me. And that, that's why back then, if you've been following me, my blog stuff, my prose blog articles and all the good stuff from before, you'll remember I did a series of articles going over EGM, basically from the beginning, issue by issue, and going over the games covered, the editorial policies, what scores were given to what games, and who gave them those scores for what reasons, kind of putting together in terms of like, for example, the strengths and weaknesses of the review cure system and all this other great stuff. So, I'm going to do the same thing now for Nintendo Power. Not in prose blog form. I actually already did that. Partially on my blog, partially on sites like uh, the blog for Hardcore, Game, Hardcore Gaming 101. But I'm going to be doing that here, in video form for Nintendo Power. I am going to, on this blog, starting to, with this episode... Go over every issue of Nintendo Power, starting from the Nintendo Fun Club news, until basically either I run out of issues or Nintendo Power comes back, whichever comes first. Because 
I stopped the EGM reviews after EGM came back. So, hey, maybe it will work again. Lightning strikes twice. My hypothesis is deniable. Just can be, it can be disproven, and it can be repeated. So, might as well start now. Why didn't I do this for GamePro, before you ask? Well, in short, GamePro is a lot more work than it is for Nintendo Power. Nintendo Power is basically confined to one system or one small family of systems, whereas with GamePro, i got to review NES, Super Nintendo, Master System, Genesis, TurboGrafx-16, and the various family of systems there. Possibly also Lynx, and, yeah, at least, like, six systems. Whereas here, I'm only having to go through, like, three systems at a time in terms of game output. Oh, and Sega CD and other CD-based systems. So, yeah, about, like, six systems. Only going from six systems to, like, at most three at a time keeps things fairly straightforward and simple. This is basically going to be my, da my dalliance in chrono gaming. If you're not familiar with the concept, check out series like Crontendo, Cron Sega, and that sort of thing. Uh, put up by a guy named Dr. Sparkle. I'll put a link to his YouTube channel and his webpage in the show notes. What the idea is, is for what he does, what Dr. Sparkle does, is he's playing through all the games put out for a particular system or, um, yeah, for a particular system in order of release. The, the idea being is to play and review everything, the whole console library, from the great titles for Nintendo like Metroid, Legend of Zelda, and Mario, to stuff like Action 52. To a certain degree, this calls for a, a amount of emulation and that sort of stuff, because some of these things you just can't get or really hard to get. But also, for the purposes of, the, of Dr. Sparkle and so forth, he's also reviewing the Famicom games as well, go, generally going by the whichever one is released first. But anyway, for me though, I'm narrowing my scope to just games which are featured in Nintendo Power. I mean, they get their write up with all the images and that sort of thing, or featured in a rundown of various game, types of games for the system, that sort of stuff. I'm not going to go over games which are we only see in the tips and tricks or the now playing column or that sort of thing, just because, again, I'm, it's just me. I'm one person, and I have college classes and stuff, too, which is part of the reason why this video is so late. So, I'm going to kind of restrain my scope just a wee bit. Um, additionally, if a game is featured multiple times in the magazine, and some are, like Legend of Zelda and Metroid, I'll go with, with, with whichever version is featured first. I'll make some exceptions for games that lend themselves for a revisiting in this fashion. For example, Legend of Zelda, I know it's covered twice in the magazine, once in the Fun Club and once in like an early issue of Nintendo Power. So in cases like that, when I get to the revisiting, I will take a look at the uh, longer version. Uh, if I take a look at, um, for example, Second Quest, um, or something like that, and then look at the whole thing as a whole, as opposed to first and yeah. Similarly, um, other exceptions will be made later. Um, as an example, Final Fantasy gets a couple articles in the magazine before it gets a full strategy guide in the magazine in Nintendo Power's second year. So I'll save Final Fantasy for the full guide later, all that sort of thing. So, anyway, with all that done, and I've run over my ground rule, ground rules, and run over, run down, run through, I think there's every other possible direction covered. The ground rules have been set. Now, I briefly want to talk to you about how the magazine came about. A voiceover. That was really awkward, but hey. Around the time that the Nintendo Entertainment System launched in the U.S., the situation for video game magazines was dire due to the video game crash. Many magazines that had discussed video games before had sh shifted their focus from consoles to personal computers. Others had closed their doors, including the first video game magazine, Electronic Games, published by Bill Kunkel, who is sadly no longer with us. 
Thus, Nintendo was in a bit of a tough situation. They had launched their console, the Nintendo Entertainment System, not as a computer or as a console, but as a toy to get in stores that were gun-shy on stocking new consoles after the failure of Atari and Intellivision's earlier systems and the crash. This is why the NES shipped with Rob, the robotic operating buddy, which is basically a toy very similar to Teddy Ruxpin in terms of being a similar concept, and also why, instead of being a top-loading system like the Famicom in Japan, which would also lead to comparisons with the Intellivision and the 2600, it was designed to look like a VCR. However, computer magazines won't cover it, because it's not a computer, and video game magazines were few and far between, so exposure became more difficult. Thus, Nintendo started a newsletter for fans, with information on how to subscribe to the newsletter in each system sold, in terms of in the box. That way, Nintendo could basically let them know what new titles were coming out, both from themselves and, in theory, from third parties. This newsletter was the Nintendo Fun Club newsletter, and it would later grow into Nintendo Power Magazine. And with that out of the way, let us begin with Nintendo Fun Club News Issue 1 for Winter 1987. For those who are unfamiliar with Nintendo Power, but not the Fun Club News, the first issue of the newsletter will probably seem a little odd. But that's because this issue is effectively monochrome, and there are no screenshots in this issue to speak of. Anyway, we lead off with a classic title for the NES, Super Mario Brothers. Super Mario Brothers is one of those games that, all things considered, probably should have been bundled with the NES from the very beginning. Honestly, the only reason I can think of why they didn't is because this is not a game that Rob could play, and they're probably limiting themselves to games that would work with Rob. Not would work well with Rob, because the games that did ship, like Gyromite, didn't work well with Rob at all, but Rob could play them. He could not play this. Either that, or the NES version of Mario just simply wasn't ready in time for launch. That's the only reasons I can think of. In any case, Super Mario Brothers basically is a game changer in terms of the platformer genre. Kind of literally. All of the elements that Mario has here, while individual pieces may have been incorporated in games before, particularly in the platformer genre, Mario combines them all into a cohesive whole just so perfectly that it is the platonic ideal of the 8-bit console platformer for any system. Master System, TurboGrafx-16, or the Turbo original TurboGrafx, or the NES, all of it. From the way Mario handles when he jumps, where the height of your jump varies depending on how much pressure you put on the button on the controller. His inertia, the way he skids when he's been in a run and you have to bring him to a stop. All of these little things which combine to just one perfect whole, making this really one of the best games of this of the NES period, which makes it impressive that a game this solid and this definitive of really video gaming in general would come out so early in this console's life cycle. As a full disclaimer, I have beaten Super Mario Brothers just not without assistance. I've used the continued code, I've used warp zones, I've used emulators and save states, I've used the save function on Super Mario All-Stars. I have never beaten it in a no continue, no warp playthrough, which is why I didn't, that footage wasn't from one. It will eventually happen someday, just not yet. Next up is Excitebike. Excitebike is your basic side-scrolling motorcycle race game. You race through each of the game's five tracks, each with progressively more difficult layouts, attempting to make the best time. The layouts usually involve hills of various sizes, steep jumps, patches of mud that will slow down your bike, and plus some speed boosts. Other than that, your character has to worry about maneuvering through the track, using your up and down arrows, and adjusting the angle of the bike using the forwards and backwards arrows. It accelerates... B speeds up running to your bike when you go down, several other purposes. Gameplay is very trial and error. Usually, it takes a few runs at the level to get things down quite right before you can finally hit the time the game is looking for. Um, 
as it is, the game is basically only five tracks long. So once you've mastered the tracks, that's pretty much it. The game doesn't remember your high scores, and there isn't an actual two-player mode, be it simultaneous or taking turns. The game has a second mode, mode B, which basically has you run through the same series of tracks with a bunch of opponents, but it's really inferior to the main gameplay mode. This is mainly due to the fact that you can collide with the other racers, and the computer-controlled racers don't have as much, in terms of AI, as much as they have AS. Artificial stupid. Their movements are random and arbitrary. Some guys will just cruise in a straight line and unswerving. Some will just wiggle back and forth across the whole track, making it impossible to get past them, and thus causing you to wreck. Frankly, you'll find yourself crashing into these guys with through no fault of your own. It is a terrible mode, and I've never spent any time seriously on it. There's no real way to practice or improve through here. You just end up getting wiped out. The third and final game covered in the first issue of the Fun Club News is Hogan's Alley. This is a light gun game, and it is basically the direct predecessor to games like Time Crisis and the Lethal Enforcer series. As the, the title of the game suggests, it's based on the Hogan's Alley training facility run by the Federal Bureau of Investigation to train new agents on quickly recognizing threats, uh, firearms use, clearing rooms, and numerous other things. This game, on the other hand, basically gives you two or three targets at a time, ask to spot the gangster, and shoot him. It gives you two different modes. One, you're just presented with three targets in a row and told to shoot the gangster or gangsters. And another one where you go through the titular alley, with targets popping out and the player having to shoot them. Unlike the later titles that I mentioned, at no point do you have, like, you know, are you shooting people? Every target in this game is a pop-up wooden target. When you shoot it, it'll spin around, or that sort of thing. There's a third mode where you're shooting cans, much like shooting Skeet and Duck Hunt, but the main attraction here is, is the gangster shooting. Again, this game is pretty basic. The main replay value of this game is for the high scores, but without leaderboards, there's no real reason to play. Now, the high score column in this mag in the magazine that would come later would fix this, kind of. After this, we get some human interest stories, both of them about video games tournaments. One is a Hogan's Alley tournament in New York, with kids going up against members of the NYPD. If you're guessing that the cops won, you guessed correctly. The other tournament is in Los Angeles, with celebrities playing Super Mario Brothers to raise money for the Scott Newman Foundation. The LA tournament is particularly notable because of one of the participants, who most people who know modern geek culture should be fairly familiar with. That person being one Will Wheaton. Will wrote about the tournament on his blog, and I'll attempt to find the article and put the link in the show notes. We also have a letters column for issue one, mostly focused on sing singing the praises of Nintendo games. This is kind of notable in that, well, we have a letters column in the first issue of a magazine. Normally, we don't get those until the second or third issue. We also get some tics, tips and tricks for the games covered in this issue, as well as an article about Fun Club members getting a subscription to Top Score Magazine, which is essentially the precursor to EGM, complete with the same editor-in-chief, Steve Harris. Now to wrap this up, if you remember my blog recap stuff of Nintendo Power from back in the day, and by back in the day I mean a few years, I did a thing at the end which I referred to as my quality control, where I picked one game to give an actual review. Obviously, that would, wouldn't would work here because I just reviewed everything. So instead, what I'll be doing for each issue of Nintendo Power is I'll pick one game from each issue which I feel is something that is worth you hunting down and finding somewhere. Assuming you're not trying to be a completionist collector or that sort of thing, and are just looking for a bunch of games to exp looking for building a library, and you're looking for some good games to start out with. For this issue, it's obvious. and Actually, for the Nintendo Fun Clubs they come, it's a pretty straightforward pick, but still, here, the choice is obvious. If you don't own Super Mario Brothers in any form, whether it's on the Virtual Console, whether it's the Super Mario All-Stars pack for the Wii, whether it's any of the other releases for any system, you should get a copy. It is 
honestly one of the greatest video games of all time. In terms of, I put it in the top 100. I wouldn't build a, I haven't come to the conclusion of what my top 100 would be yet, but really any top 100 video games list is incomplete without this game on it. And if you've never played it before, you're missing out, you're kind of owe it to yourself to give this game a shot, and a chance, the chance it really deserves. There's no good reason not to. So next week is another movie review, and then after that we continue with a Nintendo Roundup with Issue 2 for Spring of 1988. <laughs>